Gypsies. They go by many... <laughs> what a way to start a video. Uh, gypsies go by many names across the British Isles. Tinkers, knackers, pikeys, or even travellers. These groups of vagabonds have made quite a name for themselves throughout the UK, and sadly, no, I'm not about to go on a Douglas Ross-style rant about these pesky nomads. I'll leave that until later, but I'm sure we're all quite familiar with gypsies and we know that they have a pretty unique culture. But one thing that gypsies are definitely known for is their prowess in bare knuckle boxing. Many of you have already heard of boxers such as Tyson Fury, the self-titled Gypsy King. Well, before Fury, there was Bartley Gorman, the King of the Gypsies. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon earbuds, you can improve your listening experience with stunning quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. Also, it's summer, so you should be going outside and touching grass, but also listening to banging tunes while you do it. The new everyday earbuds are disrupting the electronics industry and they are better than ever with an aesthetic rubber look in multiple colours and a feel that is both sleek and discreet as well as including multiple optimised gel tips that provide that perfect fit for maximum comfort, sound quality and security regardless of the shape or size of your ears. Raycons are now more versatile than ever with a built-in mic that allows you to take calls with a tap of a button, they are compatible with both Siri and Alexa and include three easy to toggle audio profiles for you to customise your listening experience. There is also noise isolation and awareness mode for audio transparency when you need it. They also offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life and 50,000 5 star reviews. I use my Raycons every day when I need some background music throughout the day and for this I use awareness mode allowing me to hear my music without drowning out my surroundings, an essential feature that my Raycons provide. So if you want to get some top tier earbuds and also support the channel then click the link in the description down below or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get an exclusive deal of up to 15% off your order. Now, we've talked about infamous underground fighters before with the likes of Lenny McLean, who, funnily enough, actually plays a part in Bartley's story as well, because Lenny and Bartley were both active at the same time. There are many more local names that you may not have heard of that may appear throughout this story, because, to be honest, underground bare-knuckle boxing is pretty underground. So, even when you do make it big, not many people outside of that sphere will have heard of you. So, we can start with Gorman's early life and talk about how such a boy then became a man and then became the Gypsy King. Now, I will preface this entire video with an accuracy warning because most of the information in this video comes from... Bartley himself, along with friends and relatives of his. So, it's hard to pinpoint the accuracy of certain claims. Basically, if someone is their own source and their own life story, they're going to make themselves sound amazing, obviously. So, take this video with a pinch of salt and hopefully you will enjoy the legacy that is Bartholomew Gorman V. Bartley Gorman was born in 1994 into, obviously, a gypsy family, with his father Samuel Gorman being Welsh and his mother Catherine Wilson being Irish. Bartley himself has commented saying that his parents were a complete contrast of each other, with his mother being, and I quote, a gentlewoman with auburn hair, whereas his father was a dark, upright man with hair as thick and shiny as plastic. Bartley also said that his father was very fierce looking since he came from a long line of fighting men. 
You might not know, but within gypsy culture, especially in the British Isles, bare knuckle boxing is quite the tradition. So you'll have various families with a long running tradition of their men being involved in said tradition. And the Gormans were one of these families, as they had a very long line of great fighters. Bartley's father wasn't a boxer himself, but he would get in the odd fight from time to time. Bartley's grandfather, however, was known as Bulldog Bartley, and I think we can all guess how he got that name. But going even further back to Bartley's great-grandfather, he was a gypsy king. But not all of the Bartleys are fighting men, with Bartley IV, that's Bartley V's cousin, being said to be more of a lover than a fighter. Everyone being called Bartley is going to make this video very confusing, isn't it? This goes the same for Bartley's father. Although he could fight, he wasn't really a fighter. He was a much more religious, law-abiding man and a staunch Catholic, as well as apparently being a very rigid disciplinarian. This was reflected in Bartley's childhood as his father would very often beat him, giving him the belt whenever there was some tiny suspicion of misbehaving. I mean, this was the 40s. Bartley's life would, of course, be steeped in the traditions and culture of the Romani community. Growing up in a caravan, travelling with his family, living the nomadic lifestyle, all that standard gypsy stuff. And from a young age, Gorman apparently displayed a natural inclination and talent for fighting. His family did have a long-standing boxing tradition, so he learned the craft from his father and his uncles. And when I mean young, Bartley started scrapping and training with his father and he had his first fight when he was just 12 years old. And he would carry on fighting basically for the rest of his life. I would love to cover every single fight that this man has been in, but he has been in many, many fights. So many fights that in his own book, he says that he can't even remember how many fights he's been in. And that was just the standard fights that gypsies set up. This doesn't include the numerous fights that he had with random strangers and bars and clubs and so on and so on. So we're going to just focus on the main fights and encounters throughout Bartley's life, because if we don't, then the video is going to be four hours long. But you're probably thinking, besides his bloodline being rampant with well-known pugilists, how was Bartley crafted into the perfect man for bare-knuckle boxing? Well, I'm no expert on boxing, combat sports, human biomechanics, or the human psyche, but I do have a few theories as to why this man was fit to be king. For starters, young Bartley was thrown right into the deep end of the fighting world, being surrounded with the tradition of gypsy fights, along with being taught about these traditions and his own family history of being a gypsy king. This, of course, would give him a passion for this kind of thing and also the drive to live up to the title of gypsy king. But initially, he started doing it just because he really liked fighting. Now, when I say that, I'm not trying to frame Bartley Gorman as some kind of brute. Because, honestly, he was the complete opposite. The best comparison I can give is that Bartley Gorman is like the gypsy version of Chris Eubank. Very gentlemanly, very intelligent, while still being very deadly in the ring, or, in his case, the fighting pit. This would be a big part of Bartley Gorman's legacy among non-gypsies because he gave a completely different perspective to the idea of gypsy boxers, kind of going against all of the generic stereotypes. <laughs> Along with Bartley's passion for fighting, being introduced to fighting at a young age conditioned him very well to prepare him for his long list of future fights. And when I say conditioned, I don't say that lightly. Gypsy fighters are a very hardy bunch. There's a reason why so many of them are in modern boxing, such as Tyson Fury, who is actually related to Bartley Gorman. Funnily enough, there's a lot of these boxers that are all related to each other in some way or another since gypsies are a very small insular community. Kind of similar to how there's a lot of Samoan wrestlers that are all related to each other. 
Sometimes professions just run in the family. Just to give you an example of the conditioning and training, here is a quote from Bartley about his father. He said, and I quote, He used to make me spar with the big lads to toughen me up when I was 10 and they were 15. I would cry because they were hurting me so much, crying as I was fighting. But I would never give in. So yeah, eh, kind of brutal. That wouldn't be the only brutal thing. As we mentioned earlier, Bartley's father was rather abusive to him, almost always physically. He would recall that in his younger years, even when he was training at the gym, his father would hit him every day. In contrast, his father would still care for him emotionally. Bartley would describe his father as the kindest man in the world, spoiling him while beating him at the same time. Although, as we can imagine, and Bartley himself acknowledges this, these sorts of childhood scars never really leave you. So, all of these factors combined with a pretty hardy upbringing all led to Bartley becoming a very good fighter. Whether it was him fighting in school over being picked on for being a gypsy, or day-to-day confrontations in his adulthood at pubs, work sites, the discotheque, so on and so on. This brings us to his main title fight. You see, in gypsy boxing, which I will admit I'm not completely up to speed on their traditions, but from what I can tell, there are two main types of fights. There's your general bare-knuckle match used as a way of settling a dispute, like in ye olde days, because you see, before there were Twitter beefs, YouTube drama, and cancel culture, there were duels which were based and should absolutely come back but these were sort of impromptu on the spot things that just happened when they happened basically just a standard street fight but the biggest way to settle a dispute whether that be backing one's credibility and their physical prowess settling drama between families or neighbors or if that gimp hamish mccampbell said your clydesdale had soft hooves instead of just putting them up and duking it out on the spot you would issue an official challenge, which would result in a proper fight being arranged on a certain date. This involved families travelling from all over the place to come and see the fight, a referee would be selected from a neutral family, and usually a lot of money would be on the line. Basically, things would be done properly and a lot more official. So, the year was 1972. The last Gypsy King, Uriah Burton, had passed away just a few years earlier, and he was one of Bartley's idols, along with a well-known American boxer known as Rocky Marciano, the inspiration for Rocky Balboa. With there being a gap in Gypsy leadership, and with Bartley being an up-and-coming fighter, his name would start to spread, along with a few other well-known Gypsy fighters at the time, who were all seen as possible candidates for the crown. Well, that year there would be a title fight arranged between Bartley and his new opponent, Jack Fletcher. Earlier in the day, Bartley was apparently tarmacking a car park and after a day of hard work, it was, of course, time for a pint with the lads. But while at the pub, one of the individuals that had arranged the fight, Will Braddock, insisted that Bartley shouldn't have a drink, knowing that he had a fight coming up. This, however, was news to Bartley. Bartley had no idea that there was a fight planned for him. But it turns out that Will had planned for Bartley to fight that very night with Fletcher supposed to be arriving later. And he just kind of never told Bartley about it. One thing that Will did warn Bartley about is, and I quote, They will only come for you when you are drunk, old lad. As you can imagine, fighting a drunk person while you're sober is a lot easier. As an ex-bouncer, I can say that that's true most of the time, eh, uh, not all the time. This, of course, made Bartley a little suspicious. This sudden fight being arranged out of nowhere, and no one was even telling him who he was supposed to be fighting. Bartley could sense that something was up. It seemed that Will was holding back on telling Bartley who he would be fighting, because Will was possibly worried that Bartley would kick off and back out of the fight as soon as he found out who. 
Whereas if Fletcher was already there, then Bartley would have no choice but to fight since backing down at that point wouldn't be an option. They were in a pretty remote area, and just before closing, a whole gaggle of gypsies came pouring in. Notably, the nuns, the webs, the kids, and of course, the Fletchers. Bartley, of course, had no clue why they were all there until he realised that the newcomers had brought Jack Fletcher along with them. Jack was getting a name for himself because he had apparently beaten some very hardy men from Ireland and Scotland, and since Jack was a contender for the crown, just like Bartley, Bartley very quickly put two and two together. Jack Fletcher, nicknamed Ganger Jack since he worked as a roadway contractor, was outside in his big caravan waiting for Bartley. Again, this was the time before ye olde internet, so there really wasn't a good way of getting a look at your opponent other than hearing about them from other people. So, any time you issued a challenge, you just kind of had to pray that the guy wasn't some six foot eight monster. So, this would be the first time that Bartley and Fletcher actually saw each other. After the caravan opened, Bartley managed to get a good gander at Fletcher. He was a bit shorter than him, but he had a heavier build, sporting a blonde moustache. All I can imagine is your traditional idea of an old-timey boxer. Bartley did think that Fletcher looked like a bit of a handful, even though he himself was pretty fit at the time. This next part might be a little bit exaggerated because it sounds like something out of a movie, but allegedly it went down something like this. After the door had opened, they were both standing there silently staring at each other while everyone else was also staring at them in total silence. And then Bartley said, have you come to fight me? And Fletcher replied, I haven't come for a picnic, we're going to fight for Burton's vacant crown. And of course, they were going to fight. But Bartley, honestly, really could not be fucked. He had been moving tarmac all day, and he was feeling pretty stiff. But Fletcher was all set, showered, shit and shaved, the whole shebang, along with actually being sober. And, unlike Bartley, Fletcher knew he was going to be fighting that night, so he was a lot more prepared. Bartley couldn't back out now, since backing down at this point would really not be a good option for a traveller, unless he wanted to embarrass himself and his whole family. So, they would fight in a local quarry in the middle of the night. A circle of men would surround them, before both men took off their shirts. They rushed forward, and Bartley proceeded to give Fletcher a peck on the cheek before reaching in for a deep, passionate kiss. Both men caressing each other. This is the. This is a. Uh, sorry. Sorry, the teleprompter was playing up, playing up a little bit there. That's, uh, that's, that's for a different. That's a different video. So, the circle was uh, formed around the fighters, and they were prepped. The announcement was made by Bob Braddock. This fight is for the championship of the Gypsies of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Whoever witnesses it here tonight must go forth and tell it how it was. And if they do not, then they will answer to me. Before going over to Bartley and apparently whispering in his ear, he's going to test you out, old lad. You had better win this one, because I've got an acre of land on you. You know, no pressure at all, yeah, the guy only just found out he was fighting about five minutes ago. So the two men charge in and start absolutely demolishing each other, with Bartley finishing Fletcher off with a left hook. After the count, Fletcher failed to stand, so Bartley was now crowned as King of the Gypsies, the bare-knuckle champion at the age of 28. As for Fletcher, over the next few days while he was working, he started spitting up blood, and he had to be rushed to hospital. It was then discovered that he had actually broken two ribs during the fight, and he was kept in hospital for nearly a week. But from there, Bartley would have countless more fights, because as soon as you get a title, everyone wants to take it from you. And there were plenty of gypsies all across all the nations who would challenge him for the crown. Despite the notoriety surrounding his fighting career, Bartley was very well known for his cordial and humble personality outside of the ring. 
And on top of all of that, Bartley would remain deeply connected to his Romani roots and actively participate in community events, being very well respected for his loyalty, honour and dedication to his craft. It wasn't all clean fights for Bartley though, and one of the most influential moments in his life was soon to happen. In 1976, there was some drama, of course, between the newly crowned Gypsy King and another Gypsy family called the Gaskins. This led to one of their men, Bob Gaskin, beating up Bartley's brother, John, demanding Bartley to come and fight him. The Gaskins and their men had set up a ring and a race course for them to fight, with them wanting a 10 grand bet to go either way so the winner would get 20 grand. Bartley accepted the challenge and arrived at the location, but his opponent was nowhere to be seen. Something was off. Something was very, very off. Now, we aren't 100% sure of what exactly went down, who did what or who was involved, because gypsies don't snitch on each other and say things that will get the police involved, so I think the best man to explain it would be the man himself. Yeah, I was in my prime about 31, 32, and 75. This so-called champion of theirs moved forward, stripped off. I hit him with one shot, bullam, right to the forehead, and down he went. Then his men set upon me. And uh, I tried to get to the car, and there was 10 or 12 men hanging on to me, and I tried to put an iron bar down my throat. I run my teeth out of here, and they got the iron bar in my throat right down and it broke my throat really you can hear you can hear it. yeah it broke my Adam's apple I kicked out and I was kicking out and they, they grabbed my leg my leg and as they grabbed my leg they went up the side of the rustle straight up into my leg and started soaring it off after this very very brutal attack Bartley would be in critical condition for days but he managed to pull through the day would apparently be known as the Massacre of St. Ledger Day. But this massacre wasn't enough to put Bartley down because for almost over 20 years he defended his title as king, still beating the living daylights out of anyone who tried to come for his title. Besides, of course, being king, you would expect Bartley to have a few interesting stories and encounters, which of course he did. I mean, it was bound to happen, especially when you title yourself as the most dangerous unarmed man in the world, along with being the Gypsy King. For starters, Bartley encountered a few professional boxers, such as David Pierce, who had retired briefly and was looking at doing unlicensed boxing, especially against the Gypsy King. But sadly, no fight would ever take place because David was pressured not to fight Bartley since if he took part in an underground, unsanctioned and illegal fight, he would be banned worldwide by the British Boxing Board of Control. So, to save his career, the fight never happened. Although, very notably, Bartley Gorman had the chance to meet a much more well-known boxer who I'm sure we've all heard of. Muhammad Ali. Yes, apparently Bartley Gorman and Muhammad Ali did actually meet each other and even apparently had a few sparring sessions together. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of our other mad lads, Lenny McLean, aka the governor, had allegedly been called out by Bartley, but Lenny refused to fight. We aren't sure exactly why specifically, but this apparently cost him a lot of reputation. Bartley clearly had a massive influence and hard-hitting reputation within the underground boxing scene, enough to attract attention from even the most professional boxers. With that in mind, Bartley Gorman also gained the attention of another pair of mad lads we've done. The Cray Twins. I've just realised that all of the British mad lads all seem to know each other. Again, we don't know much about Bartley's relationship with the Cray twins, but it just seems like they had respect for each other, with them all being very well-known brawlers. Sadly, all monarchs must come to an end, and Bartley's reign would come to an end in 1992, when he retired himself from the title at the age of 48. That didn't mean he stopped fighting, though. His last fight was in 1997, 
He might not have had a title to defend anymore, but there's always going to be cheeky bastards that need sorting out. Bartley, although not living the most adventurous life, definitely lived an erratic one, with plenty of punches being thrown, including a variety of special moves that he developed himself and gave names such as the Bullhammer Punch, which is basically a punch to the temple or forehead. Which, that, that just kind of sounds like a punch. Being the character that he is, he would eventually gain notoriety around the world. And obviously, I do have to mention, Tom Hardy said that Bartley Gorman's voice was part of the inspiration behind Bane's voice in The Dark Knight Rises. We actually have an exclusive clip of Mr. Hardy practicing his Bane voice from behind the scenes before being interrupted by his mother, which I think we all definitely need to see. Hello! Hold on, Mom. Take control of your city. Behold your freedom. I don't want to be on that cell phone, okay? Calm down, Doctor. Now's not the time for fear. Fear comes later. Living to the ripe old age of 57, trust me for the British Isles, that's pretty good, Bartley Gorman eventually passed away in early 2002 from cancer. In the last stages of his life, he had worked on his book covering a lot more about his life. The book was actually the primary source for this video and the book itself really does give you a good insight into the man's background and I highly advise all of you to read it if you are interested in these types of stories. Upon his passing, there would be a great deal of mourning in the Gypsy community, with over 400 people attending his funeral. A lot of people have a great interest in the mystery behind Gypsy bare-knuckle boxing. But what really made Gorman stand out was how well-spoken, professional and polite he was, which I think tricked a lot of people into thinking that he was some weak pushover that wasn't worthy of the title. Just for them to get in the ring with him and for Bartley to slap the absolute shite out of them. I think this is what gave him his mystique and why he became such a respected name in bare knuckle fighting. I know that gypsies get a lot of shite. And in some cases it, it might be deserved. However, I do think that living completely separate from society to the point where you don't even have a national insurance number... I mean, it's kind of based. Lastly, I will leave you with some of Bartley's last published words that he wrote while in hospital. I feel weak, but at my weakest, I am at my strongest, because my strength is in Jesus Christ. Please God, I will give it my best, for if nothing else, I am a fighter. This is for Vash! Vars Kuczynski, or whatever the feck your fucking stupid last name is, you good for nothing lousy fucking freedom botherer. Me and you, in the ring, one man, one male feminist enters, and only one man will leave, and it'll be this fucking man. Call me a fascist. Call me a fascist. You see what fascism is? When me and you go into the ring, and my fascism ends up in your fucking ring. And that's real fascism, boy. Not your punch. Libertarian socialism. There's no such fucking thing, lad. No such fucking thing. Get a job. Get a job. And half pay for driveway and run off with the money like the rest of us. Good, honest work. Good, half honest work. Me and you, I'll ask Sam O'Hide. He only stays three caravans down. I'll fucking ask him, lad. I'll go fucking ask him right now. How, how can you be a fat communist? How is it possible to be a communist and still be a fat fuck? I'll fucking fight any communist that ever fell out of an arsehole. Right? I might steal horses, but at least I don't fuck them. <laughs> Thank you on YouTube. Everybody says What's Vosh's second name? What's his name? <laughs> run out and find <laughs> run out and find out what his actual fucking name is. What's his name? Ian Kuchinski. I don't fucking overall rush his Give him steel boys! Give him steel boys! <laughs> Give him steel boys! <laughs> <laughs> Talk your girlfriend to the shows like fingered her behind the wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
I tried to steal your wife because I thought she was a Clydesdale. <laughs> no. No. Right, I think, I think that third one was the good one. I would fuck your wife, but even I wouldn't steal that dog. <laughs> oh, fuck! <laughs> fuck! <laughs> Call them Vosh Kaczynski. Vosh Kaczynski. <laughs> 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 Fuck it.